Hi everyone, it's Betty. Um, welcome to my cooking show, Cooking with Betty. I'm actually mostly done with um, dinner. I'm just um, boiling potatoes at this point. So um, next on my agenda, I'm really just gonna give you some thoughts I've had on self as image. Lacanian psychoanalysis and the curation of selfhood and why we find, oh gosh, I spoke so good here, why we find fashion so compelling. Lots of reason. Oh my god, these potatoes look great. Okay. Um, to start with, I really have to like, oh, come on, come on pasta. I have to define Lacan's mirror phase. And I personally define it as, um, you know, that moment when a child sees themselves reflected in a mirror and identifies with that image of themselves that they see, and therefore is able to conceive of themselves as like an, its own, you know, your own self, as an autonomous subject, as an entity separate from your parents, separate from the world around you. You know, there's you and there's everything else. Whether or not you take psychoanalysis seriously, I generally don't. I do find this an especially compelling idea if we think outside of the box for a moment and think about not just, you know, the infantile mirror phase, but the significance that mirrors take on throughout our lives. Mirrors are a means by which we can really identify with images and do on a daily basis. Specifically, an image of ourselves. Um, this is harnessed sometimes. Like, you know, when you walk by a shop window and you look into it, you see yourself reflected in it as you see, just as you see, like, the stuff, the commodities for sale inside. And thereby, this ability to identify with image sometimes tricks you into buying things. But I wouldn't take that as seriously as um, what I'm about to say. A little, a slightly more apt and relevant part of what's at stake. So, what is at stake? Well, The most important part to me, as actually an art historian, is the fact that the subject, and a subject is just, as I termed it earlier, an entity that can perceive, apprehend, comprehend, and be in turn aware of being perceived. So like a person can look and be aware of being looked at can understand and in turn be aware of being understood. That is what a subject is to me. If you have, you know, you can read things on the Enlightenment on, read Descartes on forward and come up with your own idea of a subject if you don't like that, but that's how I define it. And the most, you know, the fact that a subject can identify as an image is what I find, with an image is what I find compelling. And I personally would expand that to the idea that really a subject can identify with any discernible and not even necessarily legible set of signs. But today, when I talk about fashion, you know, as much as I love menswear, I'm a cis woman. The only time I engage with menswear is when I wear it. Um, so um, I'm here to discuss women and femmes. And seeing yourself as an image, not just identifying with an image as all children who go through the mirror phase are wont to do, but perpetually seeing yourself as an image. This was best voiced by John Berger, in my opinion, in episode two of Ways of Seeing. I know I cite that a lot, but it's because it's on YouTube and everyone can watch it. Episode two of Ways of Seeing, Berger says, um, I'm just gonna read off what I wrote earlier. Women are conditioned to see themselves as image. They are socially conditioned to envision themselves 
at all times in their mind's eye, not as they are existing in the world, but as how they would be seen existing in the world, ostensibly by a man. We must understand that that was made in the 70s, and I think we've moved on a lot. Um, I personally never envisioned myself being watched by a man. I imagined myself being watched by a camera. Simulacra, simulacrum, am I right? <laughs> but, yeah. I think that the reason that, it, to, to simplify that whole thing about like, women envision themselves being seen in a way that I think more people will be able to relate to is like, men see the world in the first person. Women see the world in the third person. I know that's very binary, but I think that's a pretty good way to segue into this whole idea of consuming, viewing, imagining, envisioning yourself as image. Eventually we'll get explicitly to consuming yourself as image. But that's when more fashion comes into the question. What's interesting though about today with the whole camera idea, like I always imagine myself being filmed or photographed. I never imagine like a man watch. I could give a, I couldn't give less of a fuck, but a camera, oh, you know? So a camera is a mechanical apparatus that can see, but it's not a fellow subject. It cannot comprehend and it cannot be aware of being seen. Now machine learning and algorithmic computation certainly complicate this. But for the point of, you know, what's at stake currently, I'm not gonna talk about machines as living entities or let alone subjects, you know. A machine cannot say I in the way that we can. For now, um, yeah, no matter what, how much data tracking and computation an algorithm does, it just kind of sees you. It doesn't really apprehend you. Um, so we can complicate this later in a later video, and I'm sure I will for the, for, for, you know, what we're doing now. We really are consuming ourselves as image in a way that is no longer gendered, is the point I've been trying to get at. Men and women alike, but I think this especially goes for People who are deeply into fashion because of the deep connection that fashion and images have. And femmes, because so much of femininity is image, presentation, self-curation. So anyone who identifies, engages with, wears, curates themselves in terms of a feminine aesthetic is certainly familiar with this, regardless of your gender identity. And like, back to that whole mirror face, like, the reason that this is, like, that this whole manic thing can manifest such a big thing is because when you curate yourself as image, you can create a new image each day, and each day re-identify with a new image, which I think Lacan's mirror face is like a theoretical basis for stating. Um, I mean, images, according to Lacan, are partially responsible for the formation of the self to begin with. So, what am I talking about in terms of creation and selfhood? As terms I've been using that I have neglected to define thus far. Let's define them. Curation or curatorial practice is a field of endeavor involved with assembling, managing, and presenting some type of collection. That's off Google, but you get the idea. Assembling, what are the other words? Assembling, presenting, and managing the self is certainly what I do when I get dressed. I get dressed to be seen, if only by myself. Even at home, that's just what I do. I will always do it. I clean my house because I imagine myself in it. I play this music because I imagine that I'm in a new wave, a corny, corny new wave film. And then defining fashion. We all know what the fuck fashion is. Um, you can Google that your fucking self. At this point, I think that fashion is an empty or floating signifier. My favorite thing Levi Strauss has ever thought of. Um, that you can just fill however you want. Anyways. Um, my overall point thus far is that fashion combined with the internet of things has really allowed us all 
in a non-gendered way because it's not, we're not in the man-woman binary now. We destroyed that a long time ago. And if you don't agree, sorry, you're living in the past and your kind is gonna die off. The gender binary is fucking gone. You can perform it if you want. You can enjoy it. You can aestheticize. You can do whatever you want with it because it is dead. The new binary is human versus machine. And it is the mechanical gaze through which I consume myself now as a woman living in the year of our Lord 2018. There is no fucking male I've, I've killed the male gaze in my own mind. I basically grew up with the mechanical gaze. Watching reality television and Kim K and Paris Hilton. Ugh, like, that's the gaze that we live with. And the mechanical gaze, because of the, the internet of things and the way that images can be shared, kind of sometimes acts as proxy for the public gaze, because I don't only imagine the photograph, I imagine the photograph being watched by some anonymous subjectivity somewhere else, connected to me by ether of the internet. Like, like I play music constantly, wear this jewelry, wear this silk, because I just want to see myself that way. Nothing is actually watching me, except me. Um, <laughs> I exist physically as much as I exist aesthetically in my own mind. I cannot escape this. But neither can anyone else. My favorite examples of this are things that I see a lot in fashion headlines. Love reading them. Love reading them. I have to. It's like reading the. I, I get my New York Times daily briefing in my email, and then I'm like, time to check Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, Elle, Refinery29, and Man Repeller. It's what I do. And then, you know, some more interesting niche ones like ID Mag. Anyways, so uh, my examples of this off of these publications are things like the phrase we've all heard, get that summer glow, right? What is that glow? That glow doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in real life. It never exists in real life. It only exists on camera. A photo of Bella Hadid's skin radiant. That's like an Instagram filter and a half. That's some, that's a mechanical result of being photographed. That is a result of, back to Walter Benjamin, mechanical reproduction that we have transposed onto real life. You will never get that glow in real life, except in a mirror. When you look at yourself as an image, that the glow factor, the glow, whatever the fuck they're calling it, does not exist outside of mechanical reproduction. And yet we have fetishized it into real life. The same thing can be said for like the leg reveal. No one's revealing anything. It's just a photo that you're gonna like see once. There is no leg reveal. The same thing with contour. Contour looks fucking stupid outside of photographs and outside of the moment where you look at yourself in the mirror from like a certain, like maybe probably like 45 degrees of looking at yourself. Yeah, there's probably a 45 degree range in which contour looks good to your own eye, and if you go too far, you see a brown stripe on your cheek. It's not a cheekbone. But if you flatten the face into an image, it asks, that means, take a selfie from the front, suddenly your face is an image, and that contour looks good, but never really does. Um, I want to find one of these Vogue headlines that I'm harping on about, so I'm going to do that right now. Let's go to beauty. Seven skincare cures for erasing all signs of a holiday hangover. No one fucking looks at you enough to notice a holiday hangover, but you do because you see yourself as an image being constantly reinvented. Nine shortcuts that make the case for a dramatic holiday makeover. No such thing exists. There is no drama. It is invented. It is a simulacrum. But when you're an image, images are static and must constantly be born anew. Therefore, you're gonna do the holiday makeover. Here we are, oh my god, I was thinking about this. Bella Hadid's techno pink hair reveal is a lesson in low commitment, high impact color. Grow up, it's not a lesson in anything. Low commitment, high impact color hasn't existed since those con air things that like color your hair with chalk. This is bullshit. Like, I, it's not, it's not real, it's not real, none of it is real. You're not an image. You're not an image, you don't have to look as an image. You're a body. Like, you're more than an image, you're a person, you're a subject. You have an internal dialogue and an internal self that you need to nurture and care for. You know, just be a body, be yourself, in yourself, with yourself, and nothing else. I'm working on that. 
but you know you'll never represent or express your internal self for the commodity you purchase. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe below. Love all of you. Hope you enjoyed this video.